Hello, Montana, and hello, world. I'm Chris Hislop, the Executive Director at the Montana World Affairs Council, and this is Connect Montana, where we bring the world to Montana and Montana to the world. We're in our spring series right now, which has had a big focus on Asia. We had Ambassador Joseph Detrani come and speak to us on North Korea. Then we had former United States Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, speak about Taiwan and China. More recently, we had Dr. Taneo Akaha from the Middlebury Institute speak to us on Japan. And tonight, our focus is China. I'd like to welcome our partners from the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. The NCTA is a multi-year initiative to encourage and facilitate teaching and learning about East Asia in elementary and secondary schools nationwide. So tonight, we're welcoming a cohort of high school teachers from Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And of course, special thanks to our very generous sponsors who help us make these programs happen. The Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, and Stockman Bank. Before I introduce tonight's guest, Dexter Tiff Roberts, I just want to remind everybody about the format. Tiff is going to speak for about 20 minutes on the issue, and then we'll have time for Q&A from you, the participants. You can chat in your questions to everyone or directly to me, and I'll curate the questions and ask them to our guest. If you're not familiar with the Zoom chat function, you can hover your mouse across the screen, look on the bottom, you'll see a small speech bubble icon. If you click that on the right-hand part of your screen, the chat box will open, and there at the bottom is a field where you can type in your questions, hit return, and they automatically come up. So I encourage you to start thinking immediately about some questions for our guest, whom I will now introduce. Tiff Roberts is an award-winning writer and speaker on China, now serving as senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Asia Security Initiative, a, a fellow at the Marine and Mike Mansfield Center, and an adjunct instructor in political science at the University of Montana. Previously, he was China Bureau Chief and Asia News Editor at Bloomberg Businessweek, based in Beijing, for more than two decades. He's reported from all over China, including all provinces and regions, Tibet, Xinjiang, all of them, covering the rise of companies and entrepreneurs, manufacturing and migrants, demography and civil society, and politics and security. Tiff is also amongst a very elite group of second-time Connect Montana guests. Tiff, welcome to the show. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm glad really, to be back again. <laughs> well, it's great. It's great to have you back on. Um, and and you're again, I think you're one of two or three people who've been on twice. So I really appreciate that. Oh, well, my pleasure. My pleasure. I think last time it was, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was March. And it was, uh, we were just starting to talk about uh, a lot about COVID and the pandemic. And I just, uh, so I remember speaking about that at that point. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And much has happened since then. But also, Tiff, a lot has happened just in the last month when we're talking about China. I mean, we've seen saber rattling in the South China Sea. Uh, we saw the Anchorage summit, and that was followed not coincidentally by a summit between China and Russia. We've seen Chinese celebrities boycotting Western clothing manufacturers over protests of, of the uh, Xinjiang cotton. Now, some people are calling for a new containment strategy by the U.S. and the U.S.'s allies. Others are retooling for the fall of the West and the rise of the East. But what we're not really getting a lot of, or maybe enough of, is that inside view of China and the challenges they're facing in their domestic affairs. But in your new book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, which is benefiting from your 20 years in and around China, you break some new ground on how to understand what is going on inside. So Tiff, we look to you to help us kind of untangle these questions, keeping an eye on why does this matter to Montana and to Montanans? So Tiff, over to you, please. Okay, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Chris. Uh, delighted to be back again, as I said. Um, so I think you, you just uh, uh, read off a list of a whole litany of, uh, of issues uh, confronting China around the world, challenges that they are trying to deal with. And I think um, 
One that I would also add is uh, a sort of a reckoning within China about uh, and 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 new questions about where their economy can go uh, going forward. And uh, some of this has been sharpened by the events of the last couple of years, including the trade war, which uh, uh, had an impact, of course, on China's ability to trade with the world, and then also with the pandemic as well. Uh, there is uh, even a new slogan in Beijing to describe uh, how they want to try to adjust their economy to deal with these new challenges. And, uh, and the, the slogan, they, they always have a slogan, by the way, they always have a nice political slogan. And what, the, what they're calling it now is the dual circulation strategy for the economy. And uh, the dual part, the two part, uh, is it's dual in a nod to the fact that they know that they will continue to be uh, to trade with the world. They will continue, we hope, to buy uh, wheat from Montana and beef going forward and, and uh, semiconductor chips and Boeing planes and so on. Uh, but at the same time, the other part of the new dual circulation policy is very much focused on creating a far more self-reliant economy. And uh, this, uh, the second part again of dual circulation, and you hear this uh, if you listen to speeches by uh, Party General Secretary Xi Jinping, or you read the media in China, and again and again, they talk about the need uh, facing a more hostile world from their perspective, the need to have a much more uh, deeply self-reliant economy. A key part of that is uh, moving away from this trade-focused economy, uh, investment-focused economy, and creating a more, uh, 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 an economy that's more driven by the spending power of its own people. And that sort of uh, brings us to my book, because one of the main questions I deal with in my book is this dilemma, how China can actually become a much more, uh, rely an economy that is much more self-sufficient and reliant on the spending power of its own people. They've known for a number of years now, even before the trade war, even before the pandemic, that the previous path is not sustainable. The economy's built up a massive, uh, a massive debt burden, uh, by most estimates is now over 300% of GDP is made up by debt, uh, which in, uh, in the past and experiences in other countries has often been destabilizing. Um, and uh, again, as they, they, although they did do relatively well with exports uh, over the last year, a lot of it driven by uh, demands in the pandemic world for, for IT products, which China produces many of, they know that longer term that this is not sustainable. Um, so anyway, they're, they're trying to figure out how to become a much more domestically reliant economy. They have a huge challenge, and this is what I write about in my book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism. The challenge is that uh, close to one half of the Chinese population, maybe 600 million people, uh, made up of people from rural China, from the interior, and migrant workers who have left rural China and gone to the coast to find work, uh, are even until today treated as second-class citizens. Uh, there are some legacy policies that, that go back to the Mao era, which I'll talk about later, um, that mean that they uh, aren't very comfortable opening their wallet books and spending. So you have a, a real, as, I, as, a, as in the title of today's talk, a really unequal and unbalanced economy where you see uh, this vast growth in the middle class, but it's very much along the coast and amongst urbanites in the cities. Um, so, so this is sort of what I deal with in my book. I actually, um, I don't know how we prefer to do this. I have some slides I could show uh, pictures of, uh, of what I focus in on my book and how I came to focus in on this unequal and unbalanced uh, um, uh, challenge that China is facing. So uh, maybe I should try to pull those up if you, if you think that's the way we should do let's, this. Let's do that. Um, I'm just gonna ask, uh, let me just, while you're bringing that up, um, Tiff, a couple things. One is to keep in mind, we're looking forward to any questions that you have for Tiff via the chat function when he's done. Also, I should have mentioned my colleague, Julie, will be chatting in some information for participants, different links and, and requesting also, if you're interested in receiving follow-up information, your email address. So um, Julie, I wonder if I could ask you to um, co-host um, Tiff, if that's possible. I seem to have a, some strange um, problems going on with my own, um, my own stuff here. So, um, before, so Tiff, if just one moment, please. We're going to see if we can no call you to get that um, 
to get that on. Um, Tiff, in the meantime, where do people, where do we find your book? Where do we buy your book? I mean, I know it's Amazon, but are there, are there uh, other places that one ought to be looking for the myth of Chinese capitalism? Well, uh, certainly if you're gonna buy it online, there's, there are other good options. Uh, Pals on, pals.com out of Portland um, uh, and a bunch of other uh, sites that would support uh, independent bookstores. It has been for sale in both Shakespeare and Company and in Fact and Fiction uh, previously. I'm not, I haven't checked to see if it's there recently. So uh, I think, and you can certainly order it through them. I, uh, so that would be probably the best way to, to do it. I don't, one other thing, we probably don't have any Chinese readers on, on this evening, but uh, just a few days ago, the Chinese edition of my book was released, uh, which has been exciting. It was published in Taiwan and uh, that is available as well. I think I, I actually shared some of those links with Julie. So perhaps yep. uh, those can be shared with the audience. So we'll, we'll share that with the audience. Um, and Tiff, you should now be able to share your screen and your presentation. Okay, great. So um, let me see if I can. Um, so here we go. All right. So um, this is the cover of, the, of my book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism. It came out almost just exactly a year ago, actually. Um, and I just like to start uh, to talking a little bit about how I came to write my book, which is how I came to really focus in on this challenge uh, of China being both unequal and unbalanced despite uh, some very impressive economic growth. And to do so, I gotta take us back a, a while. Uh, this is a, a cover story that I wrote uh, in the year 2000. Um, I had been in China about five years at that point. It was a, a notable be, because it was the first time that I actually visited uh, some of the poorest parts of China. In this case, uh, a very large province in the Southwest uh, called Guizhou, which then, and unfortunately still today, uh, is far poorer if you look at per capita living standards than, uh, than most of the other, uh, other provinces in China. And uh, that, that cover story, for, I was working for Business Week, of course, you can see it here, was called China's Wealth Gap. And uh, this is just a reminder that China has been struggling to deal with its wealth gap, which is very much alive and well, sadly today, uh, for, for many, many years. This was 2000. At this point, uh, we had a, uh, a leader in China, uh, party general secretary, Jiang Zemin. He launched a policy called Develop the West. And uh, the Western part of China is the hinterland away from the coast, uh, the most undeveloped part of China then and still today. It's where Tibet is, of course, and Xinjiang. Um, and so he, he, he launched this policy in the year 2000, uh, the, the top leader of China, to try to address this gap between the coastal areas and the Western regions or the interior uh, between the city residents and the people from rural China. Later that same year, I was back again to Guizhou and uh, uh, doing another cover story you can see here called The Great Migration. And this was the first time that I uh, uh, started to write about this massive migration, probably the world's largest migration of uh, people from the interior of China uh, to the coastal areas uh, to find work on construct, mainly then on construction sites and in factories. And so for this story, I, uh, I went to two places. I went back to Guizhou uh, and visited a small village uh, and, and met a, a, a bunch of young people, all, all from this same village, all with the same surname Mo, which is fairly common in rural China in the villages to have uh, people distant, really distant relations all in a village together uh, with, a, with the same surname. Um, and so uh, the, this little village, uh, which you can see pictured on the right here much more recently, uh, called Binghua Tsun in Guizhou, uh, became uh, a place that I returned to repeatedly over the, the next two decades. And the Mo's that I had met then, uh, working then in factories in Guangdong province, so near Hong Kong, uh, particularly in particular in a city called Dongguan on the Pearl River Delta, which was just then taking off as the exporting capital 
of, of China and exporting capital of the world, really. Uh, so they were working in these factories in Dongguan, electronics factories, and then and then journeying home once a year to see their parents and, and go back to the village, uh, typically during the Lunar New Year. Uh, so uh, just two pictures from that, uh, from those two places, I ended up focusing in on my book. Uh, this is just one of the young people I, I met and I do talk about repeatedly in my book. Uh, Moru Bua became a friend of mine um, at that point when I first met him in 2000. As you can see here, he was working in a, as a welder in a Taiwanese owned factory. Um, he had left the village already, I think he was 20 years old then. Um, so I'm probably what, 43, uh, 41 now. He uh, um, uh, had left the village many years earlier. He dropped out of school, which was very common then. And unfortunately, as, as mentioned later, still common today. And uh, had, had already worked near Shanghai. He'd worked in a, a, in a city called Ningbo, also near Shanghai and then ended up bouncing around different jobs in uh, Guangdong province before going to Dongguan, before going to the city of Dongguan. Um, and this is just a picture of him on the street with his then girlfriend at the time, also a migrant worker, uh, but from a different part of China, uh, another agricultural province, uh, Henan, um, and also quite poor and a source of, of many of the migrants going to work in the factories and the construction sites. Um, and then just uh, one more picture of, of these people. This is uh, another Mo, the young woman in the red vest, Mo Meitran. It's another person I talk about in my book. This is back in the, in the year 2000 in this same village of Binghua Tsun or Binghua village, uh, which again, I return to repeatedly over the years. She had gone back. Uh, she was also working in a factory in Dongguan and Guangdong province where I'd met her, but she had gone back that, uh, later that uh, summer a couple months after I'd met her in Dongguan, uh, because she her identity card had had expired, and uh, this is just a a, a brief uh, illustration of how precarious the existence of these migrant workers was back then. Uh, it, if you had an expired identity card and you were working in one of these cities, it would be very easy for uh, you to end up in a in a very bad situation. The police would regularly stop migrants on the streets. Um, ask them to pull out all their identity cards. And if one was expired, you could get thrown in these, uh, in effect, the, in these prisons that they would, holding areas where they would keep migrants uh, that if they could find an excuse to stick them in there, uh, like an expired identity card, they'd keep them in there and in effect, force them to pay a bribe to get out. So her identity card had expired. She immediately went back because another cousin of hers and she's also uh, distantly related to Mo Rubua, the young welder. Um, but another cousin of theirs had actually uh, had this terrible fate befall him and it ended up spending a couple months in one of these uh, uh, de facto prison areas, prisons, uh, until he could get enough uh, money gathered together from friends and relatives and get out. So she was back uh, uh, in the village, um, but also uh, to get her identity card renewed, which she had to go back to do, and also to uh, help her parents with uh, the rice harvest, which was then happening. So um, this first visit, uh, again, was in the year 2000 to this small village in Guizhou. Um, was, uh, it was the late summer 2000. Already, actually, uh, people even in this small village were aware that uh, a big change was coming to China, and that was its uh, uh, eventual entry into the World Trade Organization. Uh, at that point, China and the US had already signed uh, a bilateral agreement uh, with both sides committing to opening their industries, reducing tariffs, uh, allowing more investment in each other's countries. Um, and that was the big last accession, a bilateral agreement that had to be signed before China would enter the World Trade Organization. So uh, when that was signed in late 99, uh, everybody in China that was paying attention already knew that by the end of 2001, they were likely to enter the World Trade Organization. I remember talking to the village party chief, uh, on, uh, and this is a village of, of, of several hundred people, very small, uh, and, and he was talking to me and he, and he uh, was very excited about China's eventual entry into the World Trade Organization. Uh, he was hoping, I mean, one of the reasons why they did welcome me in those early days before they got to know me was they were hoping that they might get uh, investment, including perhaps 
overseas investment. Maybe they could, uh, after they were written about in an in a international business magazine, maybe American investors might come. And the big hope was they would get a processing factory so that they could uh, move beyond this subsistence agriculture that they were doing um, and perhaps uh, uh, process the fruits and vegetables that they were starting to grow value-added cash crops. Uh, so this, this was a big question or a big issue that they wanted to talk to me about. Um, how do we attract investment to our little village? So uh, jumping forward all these years, this is a picture uh, taken not too long before I came back to Montana. So this is probably in 2018, a couple years ago, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually a picture taken not far from that little village of Bing Hua Tsun. Um, you can see uh, a, a, a massive expressway running through the very picturesque mountains there of that part of Guizhou province. Um, this is something that we saw over the intervening years across Western China, a massive infrastructure build out of high speed uh, rail as well as these big expressways. Um, and uh, if you look closely, you can see the red and gold billboard by the road. It's too small to read. Uh, but the fact that it's red and gold is a hint that it is uh, Communist Party propaganda. I think this was a, a, a slogan of Xi Jinping. So along with the infrastructure build out across the country in the last 20 years, we've seen uh, a push of propaganda from Beijing into the countryside as well. So um, this year, 2021, is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party which was founded in 1921. Um, and uh, there are all kinds of big celebrations planned, uh, particularly uh, for the next few months leading up until July 1st, which is the day that the party was founded. Um, they've already announced with much fanfare, uh, they, have, they had set some centennial 100 year goals that they wanted to see accomplished by 2021. One of which was uh, ending absolute or extreme poverty. And they, as, as some of you may know, they announced that they had successfully done that a number of months ago. And uh, they, indeed, that is a great achievement. Uh, they have reduced poverty dramatically within China. Um, they've also announced that they're going, that they wanted to double uh, per capita incomes between, I think, 2010 and 2020. And I believe that they've accomplished that as well. And that's, so that's per capita. So uh, the, you know we see we've seen these really remarkable achievements. They're celebrating them a lot of them this year because of the founding of the Communist Party, uh, 100th anniversary of that. At the same time, I just want to highlight one uh, other number or one other statistic, which says something about the distance that they still have to go. Uh, when I first visited Guizhou in the year 2000 to look at the uh, to, to and, and was covering this. Uh, the wealth gap and, and, and also the great migration story. I spoke to local officials and, and uh, one of the numbers that they would always bring up was the fact that the income gap between the average person uh, from rural China and the average person from the cities was about three to one. So your average urbanite was making about three times as much as the average person from uh, the countryside. Um, and uh, you know, we again, all these achievements over the last 20, 20 plus years, but if you look at the gap today, it still is about three to one. So they haven't made much progress on that, despite the fact they did tell me and they, they told everyone that, that wanted to listen that they were going to change that over the, over the coming years. Um, at the same time, we've seen a dramatic increase in, uh, in, in, in the income gap and in the wealth gap in particular in China. Uh, China now has uh, a society with a gap between the rich and poor, which is one of the very highest in the world. It's on par with Russia. It's higher than the United States. We don't do a very good job on, on creating a very egalitarian society here, but they actually have a more, uh, uh, even a larger wealth gap. Uh, the OECD last year uh, looked at the, the difference, the, mul the multiple uh, between the top 20% and the bottom 20% in different economies around the world. In China, the top 20% are making about 10 point, I think it was 10.4 times as much as the, the bottom 20%. Uh, it may come as a surprise that that's actually quite a bit worse than the United States, which is around, uh, I think the United States is around eight something, eight, a multiple of eight. 
So uh, China and Europe would be is even lower. So China is significantly more unequal than even the United States. Um, so uh, just before I finish here, I want to uh, bring up uh, two legacy policies that uh, I argue in my book and that have, have very much to do with this continuing wealth gap in China. And in fact, this growing, growing wealth gap that we're seeing today. And um, one of which, and I call them legacy policies because they actually date back to the Mao era. One of which is called the household registration policy or in Chinese, the Huko policy. Uh, it was established in China by Mao, um, yeah, I think in the mid fifties. He uh, borrowed a leaf from <clears throat> uh, the then leader of the Soviet Union, <clears throat> Joseph Stalin, which had a similar <clears throat> system in place um, and basically put what is like an internal passport uh, in place in China. And uh, at that time, the household registration system basically froze people uh, wherever they were born. So uh, Mao saw it as necessary to try to, uh, to be, as he built up the communes in rural China and focused on industrializing the cities, he, uh, he needed this internal passport to keep rural people uh, in the countrysides where they could produce low cost agricultural products uh, for the urbanites and the technocrats who would then uh, power industrialization in the country. So the household registration policy still exists today. It has been radically changed in that it no longer uh, forces people to stay where they are born. And that's why we have the, the great migration and several hundred million migrants in China uh, annually traveling across the country. Uh, but the household registration is still very important. It still exists. Um, and, and why is it important? It, it is uh, basically it ties the social welfare benefits, the access of uh, the children of migrant workers or rural people's children, uh, their access to education and their, uh, also their access to health care for the family is tied to the, the place that they were born or actually where their parents were born. And what this means in effect is that uh, rural people, if they do leave the countryside as migrants, um, if they do bring their children with them, they find it near impossible to actually enroll their children in city schools. And this continues right up until today. Um, and they also find it difficult to access affordable health care uh, in the cities as well. That uh, leads to this social tragedy in China, which they call the left behind, uh, left behind children phenomena. And that is the fact that most migrant workers, because of this restriction through the household registration system, end up leaving their children back in the countryside. They used to often leave them with their elderly, usually illiterate parents, um, uh, but increasingly they're, they've been put into these large impersonal boarding schools, which I visited a bunch of and wrote about in the book, uh, which might have good hard infrastructure and have like basketball courts and so on, but are, are often very terrible at teaching and also have extremely high, we see extremely high dropout rates by these children, rural children, um, from these, from these boarding schools. And the other policy, uh, just quickly, is what, what, uh, what China refers to as the dual land system. And this is, again, a throwback to the Mao era. Um, it's, uh, what it means today is that there's different political and, and economic classifications for land in China today, uh, where um, Ch land in the countryside is technically classified as belonging to the collective, uh, back, which is a throwback to the commune era. Uh, what that means in effect is that it is very difficult for the farmers or the migrant workers who typically have a plot of land to uh, monetize that land. It's very difficult for them to actually sell it in most cases. Um, and uh, this stands in direct contrast to what's happened in the, in the big cities and all the cities in China where uh, people are able to buy and sell uh, apartments. Uh, they have 70 year leases, which are look, so they're, they're not, it's not in perpetuity, but these leases are, they're starting to roll over these leases. So in effect, they have a, a thriving uh, real estate market in the cities, which has been uh, a major reason for the explosion of urban wealth in recent years. Um, and there's nothing comparable in the countryside. Uh, the land in the countryside is bought and sold, but just not by the farmers or the migrants. 
the local officials are able to, in effect, reclassify rural land away from agricultural use, um, and they can actually uh, buy and sell the land. And, and that's become a major source of uh, local revenues for local governments in China. Uh, both of these policies in, uh, make it very difficult for uh, the rural people and the migrants to join the middle class and therefore also means that they uh, aren't really uh, effective consumers, which gets us back to the this central economic dilemma that China faces today, which is the fact that only about half the population is becoming a, a big functioning part of, of the, the new consumer economy. Um, just one last shot, that's actually uh, Mo Rubo, a recent picture, uh, the young man who was the welder. This is his wife who was uh, also pictured in an earlier slide, uh, uh, his then girlfriend from Henan, they got married. Uh, this is their daughter. When I visited them, I think again in 2018, they were struggling with the question of what, what to do with their daughter because she was about to enter primary school. Typically what uh, migrants will often do is bring their children with them when they're younger and then send them back to the countryside by the time they get to primary school because of this obstacle of enrolling them in urban schools. He was adamant that this would not happen, that his daughter would not become a left behind child, which meant that he had to put her in a uh, one of these small private schools that have popped up across cities that have large migrant populations um, that are typically not necessarily very good quality um, and are actually quite expensive as opposed to uh, the public schools, which you don't have to pay for. The urban children don't have to pay for. So he, um, they were trying to figure out what to do. I spoke to uh, Rubo just a, two weeks ago, I think, and um, his daughter's in school, uh, in our small private school. They're struggling to make ends meet. He's, uh, he and his wife are entrepreneurs now, by the way, no longer working in the factories, but running a small athletic apparel business um, online. So um, let, uh, I, should, uh, let's, I should probably stop here um, and we can move on to uh, the question portion. Excellent. Tiff, thank you so much for that. Uh, enjoyed the pictures as well. Like usual, we are getting a lot of uh, questions coming in on the chat. So while you uh, maybe stop sharing the screen, there we go. Um, uh, I'm just gonna remind people, you're welcome to chat in questions um, to me directly, uh, and then I'll ask those to Tiff. I'll try to curate them. And also to remind you, uh, my colleague Julie has in the chat box put the link to Tiff's book, as well as his website and his Twitter handle. So if you want to follow Tiff on, on Twitter and other social media, you can find that in the chat box. Um, okay, very good. Let me start with uh, some questions from our uh, participants, Tiff, and I'm just going to remind you also, we're just under 30 minutes to go. So, um, you know, measure your responses accordingly, okay. if, if you would. We got a lot of questions. The teachers particularly uh, would like to know a few things. So question one, is dualism a term one might apply in China today? Basically, the hinterland and the coastal areas following different paths, with the former being a source of unskilled labor for the latter, but little else. The term was applied in colonial Africa, but not sure if it's appropriate for China. Um, I think it has been. I think it would. It has been appropriate as a as a way to describe uh, China, and that this was actually made very clear by some of the earlier political leaders in China that they uh, that they would utilize this uh, very cheap. Uh, at, at that point, relatively docile labor force uh, in order to build up this economic powerhouse and become factory to the world. So th this is, I think it is fair to say that would, a fair way to characterize it. There's also been this presumption that uh, as China starts to automate the factories, as wages have gone up, uh, it's time for these workers to go home. So it, this idea that they would be smoothly integrated into the cities as they transition to new jobs, perhaps in the se service sector or become entrepreneurs, this is not really part of the vision. And there are uh, deliberate policies right now that are, in trying, that are trying to get these people to return to the hinterland. And of course the vision is that they will uh, help lift up the hinterland and that will deal, that'll help uh, overcome inequality, regional inequality as well. But the, it's a problematic, uh, proposition. 
Jeff, um, please stop me if I'm going to overstretch a comparison here, but I would like your view on, on the dynamic you just described. Um, does that at all translate in the United States, specifically Montana, a very rural state? Are people on the move into urban areas? Do we see any of similar dynamics here, either in Montana or in the United States? Well, obviously, we have a, we've had a migrant population in our uh, throughout, it's been very important for the agricultural sector um, across in parts of the country. That's a migrant population typically um, with people coming from other countries. China is notable because with its 1.4 billion people and its vast economic disparities, they've been able to uh, rely on their own internal migrants to power economic growth. Uh, the biggest difference really, um, and this is not just different from the United States, but it, I'm often asked about, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't this happen everywhere? Don't we see this in other parts of the developing world? The migrants come, they're poor, they're abused, they start to do better. Eventually, they slowly move into the middle class. The big difference, and this is true, uh, you know, this this distinction uh, is true when you look at China compared to India or many other places. Is China actually has this policy called the household registration policy, which actually ensures that these people do not get the similar access to health care and education. And uh, by the way, I didn't mention earlier, the education, yes, they can put their children in rural schools. Typically a rural school is far, far underfunded compared to an urban school by multiple of over 10 times in many cases. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so anyway, I mean, the, the biggest distinction I would say is the fact that we do have these policies that are still sort of underpinning the sort of management policy towards the migrant workers of China and those people who move from the countryside to the cities. Okay, thanks, Tiff. Here comes a question on trade. Uh, regarding trade, does each state in the US have the power to sign its own trade agreements with China? Also, when we speak of Montana's exports to China, it sounds like it is the public, not private sector making the trade, which cannot be. Do private companies communicate directly with China or is that communication sent through state or, or, or federal government? Um, well, uh, some of the intricacies of the state, you know, state by state trading agreements, I'm not so sure, but it is uh, certainly trade uh, states will send, uh, American states are until recently, until the trade war, we're constantly sending delegations to China at signing agreements and prom, you know, the Chinese promising to buy this or that. So th there's many, many agreements signed on a state level, sometimes, uh, um, sometimes with, a, you know, with an industry association in China, not necessarily with the government, uh, but there's many, many agreements at that level. Um, do private companies uh, deal directly with the Chinese on, on these agreements? Absolutely, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the way it works here. Um, we have, you know, there are some big, um, in uh, agricultural industry associations, which are basically there just to help the companies, like the uh, U.S. Grains Council, which a good friend of mine works at, um, and they've had a very active presence in Beijing because they're trying to help these companies navigate the waters and the regulatory waters of selling more into China. But it, but much of it is uh, done at a, at a company level. Yes. Thanks for that, Tiff. Um, here comes another question. Uh, you do well by reminding us that China has domestic issues that limit its strength. Would you acknowledge, though, that they've made impressive gains in global terms during the last administration? What would you suggest we do to improve U.S. global influence vis-a-vis -vis China as we move ahead? Oh, I, I think absolutely. I mean, this has been, the last four years have been like, a, uh, you know, I'm sure Chinese leaders have been I mean, they, they haven't been happy with the trade war, but to see the chaos and confusion that has defined uh, uh, American policymaking, um, first of all, with the mismanagement of COVID, uh, then with this you know, terrible storming of the US Capitol um, uh, in early January, uh, you know, a president who didn't seem to want to admit Admit that he'd lost an election. These things are what they, they, they love this. They, they're, for a long time, they've been, uh, you know, their, their line has been that the democracy is messy, it doesn't work very well, and it often spins into chaos. And this is why the Chinese method, which is much more controlling, 
is actually what uh, is what the rest of the world should be turning to. And they've been very clear about this since about 2017. They see the Chinese model as a, an alternative to the Western model, in particular the US model. I think the last four years, again, have been uh, very good for them. They, they, if you read the Chinese media, they're constantly reporting on chaos in the United States. And if I talk to friends and relatives back in China, and much of this is, um, you know, take, people aren't too, you know, people take it, take it seriously. They see, you know, whether it's people freezing to death in Texas or, or whatever it is, these are things that people know about in China and they see it as signs of our weakness. Um, I think that going forward, uh, so far I'm quite encouraged with what we're seeing with the new administration. Uh, a, a, in, in many ways, it's a continuing, uh, a continuing policy which uh, of being sort of hard nosed towards our relationship with China, not being naive, uh, realizing that things need to change on many levels. Um, but at the same time, uh, one of the, of course, one of the big priorities of the Biden administration has been to work much more closely with allies. And I am a strong believer in the fact that, you know, we don't have a chance um, of competing globally and certainly not with China if we, uh, if we, you know, alienate all of our allies in Europe and Asia, which I think uh, was happening a lot uh, under the previous administration. Um, so I've been very encouraged. We've seen, I mean, issues like the big, uh, terrible human rights disaster, the US government is now called genocide happening with the Uyghur Muslims, Muslims in Xinjiang. We just saw Canada, the US and the European Union in rapid succession put coordinated sanctions on officials related to that human rights tragedy. Nothing like that could have happened before. And that's because you know, we're all talking to each other. We have similar concerns in Europe, uh, not, not, just, not just economic, certainly economic, but, uh, but also po uh, political and human rights related. If I'll just quickly mention uh, on your point on alliances, if you missed our show with Dr. Karen Adams about a month and a half ago, she spoke at length about this. It was a tremendously interesting um, view on the importance of alliances dealing with issues like China and others. You can see that on our YouTube channel if you like. Here comes another question from our audience. Do you have some idea as to when relationships between the U.S. and China will normalize? When, for example, might the Fulbright program in China restart? I, specifically the Fulbright program, I think, um, and also the Peace Corps, and uh, bring, sending Peace Corps volunteers back to China. I think that's uh, low hanging fruit. I think it's a no brainer, use whatever cliche you want. I think this is something, I'm a big believer in three people to people exchanges. I think it was a mistake to end those. And I think we need to, we need, we, we know they, they need to be reestablished. And I think they could, that could be done um, uh, pretty easily. Uh, I would assume that this could be done through the just through the through the present administration. Uh, in terms of normalizing the relations uh, on a broader sort of broader basis, uh, I'm more I'm more skeptical that that can happen quickly. I mean, one of the things that I think that uh, you're giving credit where it's due. I do think that the Trump administration was right. In, uh, in the sense that I think we were overdue for a reckoning of the US-China economic relationship. <clears throat> I think some of the mercantilist trade practices that China is engaged in, um, uh, its inability to meet some of <clears throat> the many promises it made in the, when it entered the World Trade Organization um, and many other issues. I think uh, it was time that we, you know, we were a little more hard-nosed, a little more realistic in dealing with China. So, um, what, as I said earlier, what we've seen with the Biden administration is, is very little change when it comes to many of those uh, tougher economic policies. The new head of the US Trade, uh, US Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, who's a Mandarin speaker, which I think is great uh, to have someone in, who speaks Mandarin in that position. Uh, she just was interviewed and said, uh, there are no plans to lift the Trump era tariffs on Chinese products at this point. She did say we're ready to talk to China, which I think is a good thing. Um, but they're moving slowly on 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 uh, undoing some of these things that have upset China very much uh, when it comes to 
comes to the economy. And uh, there's also a much stronger, I think there's a stronger focus on human rights issues under the Biden administration so far, what we can see. So uh, back to the, 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 the question, I think actually seeing the relationship normalize, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic. I don't see, I don't see the real antagon antagonisms in the relationship uh, going away anytime soon. I do not see a return to the previous status quo. Uh, I don't really actually ever, I don't think in any of our lifetimes, we're going to see a return to that, unfortunately. I think it's really interesting what you say, um, Tiff, about the not changing policy, essentially, from the Trump to the Biden administration, or various aspects of that, that kind of the, the tougher line, if you will, um, which, which is interesting, because as you know, China is Montana's third largest trading partner, um, primarily for our agriculture goods. And so it's a very key element of our own state and, and local economy here. And when we put that same question to Chuck Hagel a couple of weeks ago, uh, he would agree with you. He, he, he very much noted that um, the Chinese um, appreciate a, a tough line. They don't always agree with it, but it seems to be something that they, they understand. And, and in terms of a negotiation tactic, it may, may have worked in the past. Let's hope it works in the future. Um, a couple more questions. We have time and, and participants, if you have anything more, send it in. Um, I thought the HUCO system, sorry, I'm mispronouncing that, the, the registration system was being phased out. Is that not correct? Wasn't there a goal for phase out in 2020? Um, so what they've done, they've been talking uh, since at least 2013 about the need to phase out the HUCO policy. Um, there was a big party plenum uh, uh, of, the C of the Chinese Communist Party then where they said uh, what, I, what, what I said, which is, um, I learned it from them uh, uh, and, and the research I did in China, that they, that they need to do this if they want to transition to a new, more domestic consumption driven economy, that really their economic transition is dependent on doing away eventually with the hukou policy. Have they made much progress? Uh, no, uh, they talk a lot about all kinds of reforms. Um, they have been in the, uh, what, eight years since then, uh, the progress that they've made has been very piecemeal. Uh, it's very top down. What they will do is they will designate certain cities as those that are now uh, welcoming to migrants and migrants potentially have an opportunity to get urban hukos in those cities. Those cities often are not particularly attractive to the migrants, whereas we see in some of the most vibrant uh, and uh, you know some of the most vibrant cities that have been in the biggest draws for migrants in the past are actually slamming their doors. So if you look at the big showcase cities, Beijing, Shanghai, other cities like Shenzhen, many of the provincial capitals, they they actually um, in many many of them, Beijing and Shanghai, they've set goals to reduce their population. They've actually put up new barriers to allowing migrants to go there. So there's been this sort of vision, top-down vision that you, um, certain cities that could benefit, perhaps the economy is bad in that smaller city, or perhaps there's even a so-called ghost town where there's an excess of housing that they, that they, want, they want to fill. They'll say, oh, let's, let's funnel the migrants there. And the question of how the migrants are actually going to make a living there uh, is, is often unanswered. The other, just one other point. Uh, many of them, so one of the other things that they've done is they've, they've, they've done sort of a, a hukou light reform where they would say, basically they would strip the hukou of, the, of, 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 of similar access to education and health. And they would say, we're going to give you a hukou, you can live in this city, but actually, you know, your children can't go to the school in this city. Uh, that's that's meaningless, actually. I mean, this is this doesn't that doesn't make doesn't make the city any more attractive to the migrant just because they have a piece of paper that says that they're an urban resident. So they've done a lot of things and they've talked a lot about it and they've talked they have talked about phasing it out. But the reality is, uh, it's uh, still very much alive in China and still very much uh, uh, restrictive and a and a part of the lives of of a very large portion of the Chinese people. If this question uh, is for me, it might be a little bit Americocentric, but I, I'm trying to connect the dots on, on you know, the thrust of, of what you're talking about regarding China policy to increase self-reliance through more domestic consumption. So maybe from an American standpoint, it, it would stand to reason that if you want to do that, you're increasing the wealth of your 
of your population so they have more disposable income so that they can then consume more domestic product. If that is the proper chain of logic, is it also true that those people who are getting then more income are going to have more or different expectations from their government? Right now in your book, you, you talk about this agreement between the Chinese government and the people. So long as the government kind of supports their well-being and economic prosperity, they can deal with the, with, with, with the way they are governed. But uh, the more money and more wealth you get, does that suppose that you start to want other forms of government or other freedoms, which the government may not be willing then to provide? Um, I think actually the government has, and the, particularly the, the party, which is the, what's important in the government, um, has been very, very skilled at actually uh, uh, breaking the connection that many of us assumed. Sort of, this is typical modernization theory that as people get wealthier, they demand more. Um, uh, this is what Bill Clinton told us was going to happen when he, when he changed the, he did away with, um, he gave China most favored nation trading status. On, on, on a, a, an important step on its way to joining the World Trade Organization, we were all told that inevitably, you know, democracy will follow, you know, political freedoms will follow economic freedoms. Um, and I think China has done a very uh, uh, impressive job in in showing us that doesn't that's not the way it works. Um, and so I think that um, I don't think that they are fearful of that. I don't think they're fearful. Uh, I. Uh, that, that necessarily as people become wealthier, they're gonna demand more. Um, there's been some real interesting research in China that, well, done in China by outside scholars that shows uh, that actually uh, very much the reverse, the more people get sort of bought into the uh, success in the society the, the, as they move up the income level, in, including as they become more educated, they often are less demanding of, of, the, of the party in China. So that hasn't happened. Uh, I do think, the real concern of the party today is those people that aren't doing well, uh, that um, are not as educated, that are, as I said earlier, being systematically discriminated against. And again, the surveys that show that the uh, there's surveys that measure been done that measure levels of happiness or satisfaction amongst different groups in China. And uh, not surprisingly, the people from the cities, in general, say that they're actually the most happy. Um, uh, but interestingly, the uh, it's not the rural farmers that are the, the least happy, it's actually the migrants. And that's because, so these three groups were all, their levels of satisfaction were measured and the migrants of course get to see that, uh, they get to see how other people are doing much better than them. And the rural people don't necessarily recognize that. So I do think that's the, the real concern going forward. If I think we have time for one more question, and, and it's a big one and a very current question, can you comment on what is happening in Xinjiang? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I've actually been, yeah, I've been looking at this a fair amount recently, um, and uh, through, you know, very impressive efforts by former friends and correspondents, foreign correspondents that are still in China, uh, because the Chinese, uh, unfortunately, the Chinese domestic media can't get close to this topic because they'll go to, they'll be thrown in jail if they write about it. Uh, through, so through these efforts of different uh, media organizations, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and BBC and CNN, uh, we, you know, we're starting to realize that indeed there is, um, you know, I think without question, the biggest human rights tragedy in the world unfolding there right now. We have um, uh, the, what China calls re-education camps set up across Xinjiang. We have a significant portion of the population uh, put into these camps, adults, uh, mainly of uh, Uyghur ethnic, uh, ethnic Muslim Uyghur, the Uyghur group, which is the majority of the population there in Xinjiang. You also have some ethnic Kazakhs in Kyrgyz, which also live in China, that also make up a pr proportion of these people in the camps. And they're, they're put in there and they're supposed to basically be re-educated. There's a perception uh, by the Chinese government that they are, um, advocates of independence, that they have terrorist leanings. Um, uh, but the reality is uh, very simple things like uh, a Muslim man growing a beard uh, or having relatives abroad and regularly making phone calls abroad or um, 
teaching your children about the Quran. These sorts of things have have, have ended up uh, sending large numbers of the of these local people into the camps. Um, many cases separate one of the great tragedies that's unfolding that's been uh, recognized recently is the fact that we're seeing uh, a huge surge in the numbers of children in orphanages because so many parents have been put into camps. Um, so um, uh, uh, I think from the Chinese government's perspective, they are deeply fearful of uh, effort. Uh, there are some people, no doubt, uh, amongst the Uyghur group there that have would like to see an independent country. Um, they have had degrees of independence over the years. They have a, a, a radically different, they have a very, very different culture. They, they share much more with uh, Turkish people uh, culturally. Their language is similar as well than they do actually with the majority Han Chinese. So um, there's been this uh, effort to basically remold them through these camps. And uh, it's, a, it's just, it's really awful what's happening there. It's uh, um, like I said, I think it's the biggest human rights tragedy we have unfolding right now. And uh, Tiff, is there a connection between, as I understand, um, recently the, the, some um, there was some protest of clothing manufacturers for using Xinjiang cotton, and then there was a reaction from Chinese celebrities against those retailers and manufacturers. Is that the same issue, or am I off? Uh, it's, absolutely. Yeah. So what's been happening is. Uh, the same time that people have been put into camps, um, uh, either as they have actually started to shut some of these camps, uh, some of the people that were imprisoned in them have been put into situations of uh, where they're doing forced labor. And one of the areas that advocate uh, activists that have focused in on is 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 the cotton industry because uh, China provides twenty percent of the global cotton. The vast majority of it comes from Xinjiang. So uh, uh, it's often, China is also the world's largest uh, um, textile producer in the world. So uh, in any cases, the cotton produced in Xinjiang, which may have been, uh, may have been produced through forced labor, um, is uh, mixed in with cotton from other parts of the world. So the reality is, you know, a bunch of us here on this call right now are wearing clothing that has Xinjiang cotton in it. So the, so the Chinese government, yes, has responded very strongly. They know that, um, uh, that this could be um, devastating to the economy in Xinjiang. They already, uh, they've already hit the economy pretty hard through all the security measures they've put in place, and they don't want to see this happen on top of it. So there have been these boycotts, very much organized and encouraged through the state. Uh, in China. Well, Tiff, thanks a lot for that. I mean, um, we've never once had enough time to answer all the questions that come through, but uh, I really appreciate your remarks and, and the, the Q&A session that we've had. So thank you so much um, for joining us and, and kind of lending your, uh, your expertise, um, not just to all of the participants, but particularly those teachers who are um, engaging with the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. Special thanks to all of you teachers. We know that um, this has been useful for you and, and I hope that you can bring it into your classrooms. So uh, before signing off, um, I want to thank once again, our very generous sponsors, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, and Stockman Bank. Next up, which is next Tuesday, same time, 6 to 7 p.m., same Zoom link, is Mr. Ali Nurani. He's the executive director of the National Immigration Forum. He's going to talk on international immigration and focus on the inherent dignity of individuals, the dynamics at the border and political divides, and how immigration can help bridge the gaps in this country and others. After that, we're going to welcome former Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Wesley Clark. General Clark is gonna talk about what he calls the conversation America needs, civility, bipartisanship, and America's standing in the world. So you won't want to miss those. If you've missed any of our previous events, 64 of them so far, you can find them on YouTube. Just search the Montana World Affairs Council. Again, if you've not sent Julie, my colleague, your email address to receive only one email, you're not going to get yourself on the big mailing list unless you tell us, um, a follow-up to this talk with various links from TIFF's 
book and and different articles and different information relating to this event. So let Julie know if you'd like to receive one of those. And let me know if you want to hear about any other issues. Drop me a line at info at montanaworldaffairs.org. I'd like to know what you think about the show. I'd like to know what other issues you'd like us to bring up. So I'd be very happy to hear from you. So once again, I want to thank all the participants and the sponsors. And to you, Tiff, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. So until next Tuesday, everybody, be well and goodbye.